Well, good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. Welcome to our weekly Café Pause. Today, we're joined by Deutsche Welle's senior news anchor, Sumi Somaskanda. Welcome back, Sumi. It is great to see you again. Likewise, Steve, great to be back on a really uh, interesting day in German politics, I'd say. Well, I, I feel particularly lucky because you are our very first guest when we started our Café Pause series just over three months ago on March 1st. And in our conversation then, we talked about the two upcoming state elections on March 14th in Baden-Württemberg and, and Rheinland-Pfalz. And so it seems fitting to have you back today, the day after the state elections in Sachsen-Anhalt. And that's where I'd like to start our conversation. This was the third election in Germany's Superwahljahr and has, seen by, has been seen by many as the last big test, litmus test perhaps, uh, ahead of the national election in September. And going into this election, there were some serious concerns that the populist alternative for Germany, AfD, would emerge as the strongest party. Of course, that did not happen. And so for our, our viewers, let me just quickly go over the, the results. The CDU came in with 37% of, of the vote. That's a 7% increase. The AFD came in with about 21% of the vote. That's about a 3.5% decrease um, and much lower than some people had expected. The left party, Die Linke, came in at 11%, a loss of 5%. The SPD came in at 8.4%, a loss of 2.2%. It's fair to say one of the party's worst results in a state election. And the FDP is back um, after having been out in Sachsen-Anhalt. They um, not only surpassed the 5% hurdle, but they came in with 6.5%. And the Greens came in with 6%. So, um, Drawing sort of the connection to the two state elections that we talked about last time, and of course the election yesterday in Sachsen-Anhalt, um, I think it's probably fair to say that the CDU, the Christian Democrats, had fairly mediocre returns in the other two state elections. Is this a, quote, comeback for the CDU? That's at least how um, the party's Secretary General Paul Simiak described it. Yes, yeah, Steve, I, I think it's safe to say that it certainly is a big boost for the CDU. Um, we are seeing conservative party leaders, uh, CDU party leaders, um, strategists, lawmakers, supporters, all saying today that this is a clear victory, a resounding victory, and really a mandate not only to govern in the state of Sachsen-Anhalt, Sachsen-Anhalt, but also a sign that they've won back trust from voters to lead perhaps on a federal level, looking ahead towards federal elections in September. And so there's a lot of celebrating in CDU headquarters and CDU you, uh, corners uh, this morning. Uh, but I think so. Certainly, we have to say it's a big boost for the party. But I do think that there are a few factors at play here that are important to understand why this was such a victory um, for the Christian Democrats. And one you mentioned already, um, in the lead up to this election, this really was seen as something of an existential crisis for democracy. Um, there were a few polls that had indicated, one poll in particular rather, um, from INSA, which is a polling institute here, that it indicated that the AFD was poised to come out uh, to emerge as the strongest party. And that spurred kind of this flurry of action, not only from the city, but really from all of the mainstream um, democratic parties that were uh, taking part in this election. And a lot of CDU strategists have said, um, you know, in the last 24 hours or so that this poll was really instrumental in mobilizing and galvanizing voters. So galvanizing voters to cast a ballot against the AFD, essentially to block the far right party from becoming uh, the largest party, the strongest force in this state. And that is something that's pretty remarkable because it was essentially an all hands on deck approach. All of the other parties indicated as much. If you saw some of the interviews that um, took place with the lead candidates from the other parties yesterday, uh, they first congratulated the CDU on this victory, but also thanked voters for uh, making sure, ensuring that the AFD did not emerge as the strongest party. And if you look at the election analysis as well of how people cast their ballots, it's remarkable to see that uh, there were voters from the left party and also from the Social Democrats that cast their ballots for the CDU. Now, 
I didn't speak to those voters myself, but I think it does indicate again this uh, coalition or alliance, if you will, uh, if you will, of, of democratic parties working against something and perhaps not for a certain result. And I think the other factor that's at play here, Steve, um, that is also important to mention is the popularity of the incumbent here, which is the Minister President Raina Hazelov, who uh, was very, very visible in media and on the campaign trail as much as that was possible in the pandemic in the days leading up to the election. And he, again, in a deeply conservative state, which Sachsen Anhalt is, uh, is, is popular there. And I think those two factors were really instrumental in, in this victory for the CDU. So yes, um, a comeback in, of sorts, but also a very specific scenario in case here. Thank you for that. And I'd like to, to maybe um, sort of pick out at least two things that you just touched on and, and drill up down on them a little bit more. Um, one of the analyses that I heard uh, yesterday as people were sort of tallying the votes that had come in was a little bit of this analysis of the movement of votes um, to the CDU. Uh, and one of the things that struck me was that most of the votes for the CDU came from nicht vela or people who had not voted previously. And then in the analysis, it went through and it was, you know, sort of between 10,000 and 15,000 voters um, from uh, the other parties, whether it be the SPD, the Linkspartei, some of the other parties that had cast their ballot for the CDU um, in a show of support against the AFD and to, to really thwart the AFD's ability to become the largest party. Can you talk a little bit more about sort of that, that movement of voters and election participation um, in this election? Yeah, so election, election participation in the state of Sachsen-Anhalt and Saxony-Anhalt had actually um, had ebbed in recent elections. So if you looked at kind of the participation numbers or turnout numbers of the course of the last five or six elections, they had steadily declined up until 2016, which was the last state election in which the AFD for the first time was on the ballot. And there you saw voter participation rise again because there is a lot of support for the AFD in the state. And I think what we saw is that you know there there was a decent voter turnout, so above sixty percent, um, but really the, the mobilization, the, the the power of mobilization and galvanizing voters here was to try to stop the AFD, as you just said, and that is something that that was messaged by all of the parties in tandem. And that's something that's fairly unusual. You know, this is a super election year where the parties are trying to profile themselves against each other, show how different they are and where they stand out compared to the other parties as much as possible. And yet they were very clear here. And this is something that I think has been a learning over the last four years, that in order to um, ensure that the AFD is limited in its capacity to um, govern and to play a, a key role in policymaking, that they have to band together. And that's why we've seen this, this, this common messaging, this kind of um, uh, coalition of democratic parties uh, coming together to say, whatever it takes, we have to ensure that the AFD uh, does not gain an even bigger foothold in the state and, and start to drive policymaking. Um, in particular, we should say that the AFD in Sachsen-Anhalt and in East German states, so in former East Germany in particular, are very strong. And so there's a fear that there is this... Um, uh, trend towards a deeper divide between East and West because the AFD continues to gain ground in these states and, and not in the rest of the country. So all of this led to this, this real concerted effort um, by the SPD, the Social Democrats, by the Greens, um, by the CDU, um, and even from, from Die Linke, so the left party as well, um, working together in a way, not, uh, not necessarily formally together, but in their messaging at least, uh, to say that they stand together against a far right party taking the lead. One of the things that struck me was was how poorly the the Linke, the left party, did. Um, they've traditionally been the party of the East, the party of the Neue Bundesländer, um, and yet they, you know, over the last few years, certainly have been seen to be losing ground to the AfD, but also to some of the other parties. What's your assessment of where the Linke are and where they're going? Yeah, I think the Linka 
not, perhaps not um, that unsimilar to the AFD, but the Lincoln in particular has suffered from um, many internal battles uh, direction, in, in which direction the party is headed. Uh, they have various figures, one of them being Zara Wagenknecht, for example, who's been more polarizing among party members. So she's been a mainstay in the party for so long, but also um, other members of the party who have been arguing over which direction Die Linke should be going. Should it be more moderate? Should it be kind of true to its more um, traditional uh, values. And, and that has made it very difficult for the party to agree upon a face or two or three figures who can lead the party forward. And I think that has cost the party, certainly, um, some, some voters. And, you know, Zara Wagenknecht was on one of the main talk shows, and I'm sure you're aware of Steve um, Anaville last night, speaking precisely about um, some of the, the failings of the left. And she very much couples or, or puts uh, her party's fate in the same boat as the Social Democrats and says that she believes that there's been too much uh, focus placed upon uh, cultural topics, so as she de uh, defines them, so identity politics, uh, questions of, of um, gendering language, for example, and not enough on the basics of what drives voters in those states. So um, for, for her, from her perspective as a leading voice in the left party, um, they, the left has gotten away from its kind of core competency of focusing on fighting for workers, so for, for working class um, people and for the working poor, if you will, uh, which is especially important because if you look at some of the surveys that were taken of voters um, after or as part of the election, many of them, uh, I think it was 40%, 42% uh, rather of AFD voters said that their uh, living standards have gotten worse in recent years. And so this is clearly a perception that, that voters feel that they have and the mainstream parties haven't found a way to tap into that and, and increasingly the left has not either. Um, and, I, and I think that because the left sees itself more and more tied towards the fate of the SPD and left wing parties in general, that has made it more difficult for the left to continue their um, their trend of credibility in the region in former Eastern Germany in a state like Second Anhalt. Mm -hmm. Sumi, you mentioned just now you know, the, the importance of personalities. And earlier in our conversation, you you touched on the minister president, Rainer Hasselhoff, who's been in office, I guess, for about a decade. He enjoys very high popularity ratings of over 80%. Um, and as you said, he's, he's been very visible. Um, how much do you think the, the victory by the CDU is due to him and his efforts? And to what degree was it uh, some of the high level visitors that he had come to Sachsen-Anhalt in the run up to the election? The fact that people are thinking about the fall um, and the national elections, or was it really sort of built around, around him and, and his achievements? I would say this is far more the achievement of Raina Hazelov than it is the CDU in general. Remember that we've seen the string of poor performances by, by the CDU. You mentioned the, the two previous state elections. And if you look back further to state elections in 2019 and, and European elections, the CDU's had the string of con consecutive kind of declining numbers. And the fact that Raina Hazelov is, is so popular in his home state, um, I think is one of the main drivers uh, of why the city performed so well. You mentioned high profile visitors. So certainly Amin Lashet, um, the party chairman and chancellor candidate for the, the CDU, um, was very present um, alongside Raina Hazelov as much as that was possible in the pandemic um, and really threw his support behind him. And this was the first election since Amin Lashet was named the chancellor candidate, as you know, Stephen. And, and it, right. it is interesting to, to see that after this incredibly bruising kind of drag out, you know, battle for, for who should be um, the chancellor candidate of the CDU, that it was, I mean, not should able to gain a little distance from that and to kind of steady the ship a bit because it was such a damaging battle for both him and his contender, his competitor, Marcus Söder from the CSU, uh, CSU, sorry, from, from the Bavarian sister party. Um, that, that it was indeed, today at least, it's being seen as very much a victory for him as well. Um, you know, and, and as he was present in campaigning, but again, 
Sachsen-Anhalt, Saxony-Anhalt is a unique case of a very conservative state. So this is really home turf for the CDU. This is a place where the CDU is, has historically performed very well. And so um, also, if you look at the fact that the um, CDU delegates in the state of Sachsen-Anhalt, they actually preferred Marcus Soda as their chancellor candidate. Mm -hmm. didn't they? So um, it, it's hard to say that this will really benefit or this was the, 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 the work of Amin Laschet, but I do think it's something that he will benefit from. It is something he can point to and say, you know, this is a, a sign that I can close ranks behind me, even the more conservative elements of the party, those who might have doubted me and with this kind of united front go into a successful election campaign season now in the summer um this being the last lit litmus test as you called it ahead of those elections i think it's something he can certainly draw upon but i'd be more skeptical to say that this really was um the a product of his popularity let's say in it, it might even be fair to say that if the if the afd had performed as well as some people thought that they might it would have been incredibly damaging to Amin Lachet and the CDU. But the fact that the CDU did as well as it did may help bolster Amin Lachet on the path to the September 26th election. But because Sachsen-Anhalt is a relatively small state yes. and is a unique case, there's a limit to how many conclusions one can draw from yesterday's results on a national level. Yeah, I, th I think there, there is a limit there. I mean, again, as you said, it's a, it's a unique case, a small state. Um, yes, a litmus test in some form, certainly at least for East German states to see uh, how well the AFD can do and is doing at the moment. But it is difficult to draw kind of general conclusions, especially if you look at how the Greens performed in a state uh, like Saxon Anhalt, where on the national level they're po or in West German states are polling uh, much, much higher. But there are some trends I think you can take away from this election that are, are at least indicators for that September vote. Um, the fact that the Greens really are still struggling to win over rural areas and kind of um, the, the smaller cities and towns uh, and for that matter, East German states as well. The fact that the Social Democrats are still struggling massively to gain any sort of momentum despite the relative popularity of their chancellor candidates, so the finance minister Olaf Scholz, they have not been able to capitalize upon that for various reasons that we can um, perhaps get into when we talk about uh, the SPD a bit more. Um, and the fact also that the FDP, so the Free Democrats, um, you mentioned this when you kind of were reading through the numbers, um, Steve, but they have overperformed um, expectations. Um, they have perhaps tapped into a, a group of supporter, groundswell of support of those who are looking for an alternative, a conservative alternative, at least economically, to the CDU. Um, and the Free Democrats were the party uh, that really questioned um, pandemic lockdown practices and practices and policies from the government and pr provided a, a demo democratic alternative. So the other party that was also extremely critical was the AFD, but for most voters, that's not an option. And so um, the FDP uh, picking up some voters uh, is also an indicator of what we're seeing in national polls. So yes, Lachet was front and center, and maybe you know that's something that you can take away heading into the elections that we'll see a lot of him um, really out on the campaign trail and trying to actively drum up support. Um, but the rest, it, we'll have to see how it really plays out. So let's unpack the Greens a little bit more, um, and then and then the SPD a little bit more. Um, you know, you you touched on it. Uh, the Greens have been performing strongly in national polls. Um, I think the, the levels of support for them are going down just a little bit over time. Um, they did not do especially well in Sachsen-Anhalt with 6% of the vote. And as you said, you know, they've, they've not been a strong party um, in the East. But there have also been some other issues that have been going on within the Green Party. And, and you, know, you talked a little bit about why they, they are struggling for support um, in the East, and we can, we can talk about that some more. But as I said, there are some other issues. You know, one of the topics that's come up in, in recent days has been a proposal to increase the cost of gasoline. Um, and Annalena Babak has supported her party's proposal to increase the price, the price of gas by 16 cents. Um, and this has been quite controversial and has led to sort of attacks from all of the other political parties, it seems. Um, but can you talk a little bit about sort of this proposal and, and what it shows us about some of the, the infighting um, and jockeying between the parties? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it says a lot about the fact that 
uh, you know, we've seen this incredible flight of the Greens um, on national levels, as you said, they've been risen kind of really to the level of a Volkspartei, so a big tent party, because they've been so successful in polls. And in particular, after they unveiled Annalena Baerbock as their chancellor candidate, um, there was a lot of celebrating of her, this young, talented woman as, as perhaps the next chancellor of Germany. And if you looked at polls at the time, um, it clearly is very, it still is a, a possibility that she could maybe lead the government if the Greens come out as the, the biggest party. But of course, that opened, you know, then it became open season for, um, for really uh, attacking the Greens and their policies, as is normally the case in a campaign season. And this in particular, ahead of this election, um, the Sachsen-Anhalt election, where you have so many rural voters who are dependent upon their cars to get to work. Uh, and this was really a thorn in the side for the Greens in that state. And the suggestion that you're talking about um, raising petrol essentially by 16 cents. The funny thing is that the politicians who actually uh, are criticizing this proposal are the same ones who introduce this carbon price yeah. that they introduced for transport and for heating fuels at the start of the year. So the current governing parties, the SPD and the CDU, CDU and CSU. And essentially their decision raised the price of petrol by around seven cents and the same carbon pricing system would, would lead to a total rise uh, of 16 cents per liter. I know it's kind of a bit wonky, but it's 16 cents per liter by 2025. And what the Greens proposed in their, in their draft um, manifesto, essentially, for the election was to reach this price two years earlier. And what I think has kind of been lost in the debate is it is essentially a price that would be paid back by the fact that electricity prices for um, consumers here in Germany would go down. So it, it equals itself out. But what it shows us, I guess, if we get away from the, the numbers and the nitty gritty of it, is that um, there, the other parties, seeing how successful and popular the Greens have become, are very eager to paint them as the elite kind of city dwelling party that is focusing on policies that will um, benefit perhaps the environment, but really hit the wallets of the average German, the people who rely on cars and have to um, pay the price of those extra 16 cents. And even if the, the actual facts of the matter that the CDU and the SPD and the CSU have themselves agreed that this is going to be a necessary price hike in the very near future, um, wasn't really, you know, was got, got lost in the discussion. It shows us that this is going to be something the Greens are going to fight very, have to fight very hard to shed themselves of this image. And we saw Robert Habeck, the co-party chair, mm -hmm. um, on, you know, political talk shows last night, att attempting to do precisely that. Uh, I, in my opinion, I, I didn't think it, it came across particularly well. But um, one more note, Steve, on, on how this is all kind of this controversy surrounding the Greens and the 16 cents price race has kind of been escalating. At the same time, we've seen um, uh, a lot of Annalena Baerbock's detractors pointing out uh, some embellishments in her um, resume, uh, in some of the, the, the terms that were used. And I won't get into the terms because it would get into specific um, German translations that might be kind of a bit more difficult to explain, but embellishments in her resume and the, the fact that she didn't disclose more than 20,000 euros in um, additional payments that she'd received between 2018 and 2020. All of this taken together has shown A, that it really is all of the other parties gearing up and you know, ramping up their rhetoric ahead of the election season to try to really um, to, you know, take a shot at the Greens, and B, that perhaps the Greens weren't as prepared um, as they could have been uh, to know that Annalena Baerbock's resume is going to be picked apart. That's part of campaigning. It's part of an election season. And so it, that surprised me a bit to see that that perhaps wasn't vetted as uh, extensively as I'd expected. Well, and what's what's interesting too is it seems as if um, because of the popularity of Annalena Baerbock and the spike in polls, all of the other parties, of course, have turned on her and on the Greens because that's kind of the party to beat, right? Especially yeah. when you look at the difficulties that Amin Laschet had to become the Kanzler candidate or Chancellor candidate of the Christian Democrats. Um, it's interesting, I find in, in the polls to see how poorly the Social Democrats are doing and yet how well ranked Olaf Scholz, the Kanzler candidate or Chancellor candidate of the Social Democrats is. He seems to be coming out over Amin Laschet and in some cases over Annalena Baerbock. And so there's a discrepancy there. Um, and so perhaps turning to the SPD, you know, I'd love to get your assessment of, of where the SPD is because they, they seem to be absent um, as they were largely in, in Sachsen-Anhalt. 
Um, and yet Olaf Scholz seems to, to be, you know, a, a good figure um, or cutting a good figure that people are, are interested in and someone in whom they have confidence. Yeah, indeed. It, it is, you know, I, I feel like as with many of these topics, you could write books on this, the demise of the center left, not just in Germany, but across Europe, right, Steve? And I think that Olaf Scholz is seen as an able, steady crisis manager, uh, even perhaps um, somewhat visionary in his views of, um, you know, kind of this, this global corporate uh, tax, a minimum global uh, corporate tax that has been introduced by G7 finance ministers, this plan at least, uh, as, as someone who would be uh, perhaps a good chancellor. And as you said, when you put him in direct comparison with Amin Laschet and Annalena Bebok, he edges out just ahead of them. But the social democrats themselves uh, have really found themselves in a bit of an identity crisis and not knowing which direction they're headed. Um, and this has been going on for some years. First and foremost, the fact that many of their policies, so their let's, kind of traditional core social democrat central left policies um, over the last, so in the 12 out of the last 16 years that they were in government, were usurped by Chancellor Merkel herself, who could kind of come out front and center and take credit if you will, for uh, those, those more social democrat policies. And she herself um, was very much center instead of center right as, as a chancellor, right? So she could take, up, take on many of those positions as her own. So the social democrats lost a lot of the visibility for the policies that are their bread and butter. They've also lost their credibility in, a, in their ability to argue that you know, some of the policies that they see is crucial for the country going forward will actually be implemented because they were indeed in government all of this time. So um, it, it makes it more difficult for um, you know, kind of, let's say, more traditional worker voters who, who would cast their ballots for the SPD for many years to believe that they are still um, kind of the, the at the heart of SPD policy making, um, and I think a lot of this also you'd, you'd have to say goes back much further, and it goes back to the era of Gerhard Schröder when he introduced the um, uh, labor market reforms that uh, slimmed down um, welfare payments and social mm -hmm. the social payments made to people who aren't employed, and um, the feeling that this hollowed out the, the the social welfare program that the German government provides and. The fact that that was a social democrat chancellor who spearheaded that policy, um, I think that that is one of the many steps that the SPD took that uh, really hollowed out, hollowed out much of their base. And so who is the SPD working for at the moment? Is it for, you know, kind of the educated? Is it for uh, teachers and bankers and, and, and academics? Or is it union workers? You know, I think they're still trying to find their way. And last but not least, Steve, I think the SPD finds itself perhaps in the same vein as the Democratic Party, again, in this existential crisis of are we more left? Are we more middle of the road? Um, just as with the Democrats, there is this battle between uh, the progressive wing and the middle wing, right? And you find that here as well. So all of that has led to um, very low and poor numbers for the SPD on the national level, despite a very popular chancellor candidate. You, you talked about the fact that there are so many books that could come out of this. And I think one, one book is a book that compares the German Social Democrats and the American Democrats and how yeah. they have sort of lost touch with organized labor, lost touch with the working class, evolved in a somewhat different direction and how both parties to a degree are paying the price for that today and, and what that looks like. I'd, I'd like to ask maybe one more question about, about Olaf Scholz and this is something that, that you had just touched on. I mean, yes, over the weekend at the G7 finance ministers meeting, um, there was agreement on this proposal for a new global minimum tax for companies. Um, Olaf Scholz described it as a tax revolution um, in, in one of the articles that I saw. But there's already been some very quick criticism. Um, and actually in the Handelsblatt, um, Mar Martin Grieve analyzed the conversations and basically said that, that if this goes forward, Germany stands to lose billions in corporate tax income. Um, you know, many people thought of Olaf Scholz as obviously cutting his own way, but, but following in the footsteps of Wolfgang Schäuble when he took over as the finance minister. Um, in terms of the business community, there was a fair level of confidence that Olaf Scholz, you know, was, was even-handed and would think about the interests of business as well. Do you think things like this um, tax proposal uh, and the impact that it could have on business 
might have any bearing on Scholz's campaigning or on sort of his status moving forward um, toward the elections? I think, I mean, I think that the SPD will had already has been very quick to seize upon this as a obviously as a massive success for their candidate. I think that it, it could have some bearing on Olaf Scholz's chances as chancellor candidate and that he could be seen or painted at least by the CDU, the CSU, as a, a fiscally irresponsible perhaps and, and beyond that not having the, uh, the, the wealth and stability of the German economy and German business and the German business environment um, uh, you know, kind of at, at the center of his policy proposals. Um, but, you know, honestly, I, I think what will hurt Olaf Scholz more than anything is really, again, coming back to the lack of popularity of his party. What these types of policies, as you said, right, rightfully said, have been criticized for how uh, realistic they may be and what impact they might have on uh, on German business and um, on the uh, wealth of the German economy and stability of the German, German economy. I think that regardless, the German finance ministry has been, since Olaf Scholz has been at the helm, relatively steady in its policy making and its approach. And even Olaf Scholz himself has reassured in this um, debate that kind of uh, came out a few months ago over whether Germany should return to its debt break as quickly as possible. Even Olaf Scholz indicated that as much as his party um, has has made very clear that they see massive uh, public investment as the road forward of the next decade or more. That he believes, as finance minister, that kind of that fiscal austerity and also return to the debt break is also in the best interest of the country. And so I think that sometimes puts him puts him at odds with his own party and and their policy and their their election campaign program that they indeed have already put out. But I don't see it as having a, a massive impact on his chances as a chancellor because he has been, as you said, relatively even handed until now. And again, this global corporate tax, minimum corporate tax, there has been really a groundswell of support for that in, in you know, broad sectors of the population. Yes, there is some criticism of it, absolutely. But I think that he's Olaf Scholz is very much tapping into um, a willingness and support that is there that might not have been, let's say, five years ago. So there's almost a sense of a bit of a, of a tipping point when it comes to fiscal policy coming from Germany. Well, and that leads to another topic that you and I had, had sort of exchanged emails about um, just a couple days ago. Wolfgang Schäuble had a, a piece in the Financial Times about fiscal orthodoxy. And um, uh, basically, you know, the what I'm hearing from you in, in your description of Olaf Scholz is it seems as if Scholz and Schäuble are, are very close in maybe pulling back or holding back or, or being more reserved. That's perhaps the best way of, of describing it when it comes to even more European integration that here you have a social Democrat and a Christian Democrat who are sort of saying, you know, wait a minute, let's, let's slow down a little. Yeah, essentially, I mean, I think uh, I would, I would put them perhaps on both team caution, if you will, but I would say that Volkan Schäuble is certainly far more conservative, as yes. we know, than Olaf Scholz is. And this um, opinion piece that you've you've pointed to from the, in the Financial Times, I think, has also gotten a lot of criticism in Germany uh, from the messaging that we've seen from Wolfgang Schäuble. On the one hand, um, embracing some of the short-term fiscal policies that were agreed upon to combat the, um, you know, the fallout of the pandemic economically. Um, so the European taking on of debt, for example, or the, the massive aid programs that Germany itself has introduced, he sees them as absolutely necessary, but in the same uh, tone as well has, is admonishing other European member states um, and, and specifically Italy uh, and, and warning that a return to fiscal austerity as quickly as possible is absolutely necessary. And it comes across as um, a wrong-footed statement in a time where absolute European uh, unity and partnership is paramount, in a time where you know, we're still in the midst of a one, once in a century global pandemic, um, where you know, countries like Italy and Spain in particular really uh, suffered 
uh, Italy, uh, the Italian, um, you know, region of Bergamo, we know was one of the first to be hardest hit here in Europe. And there was so much sympathy and also solidarity with Italy at the time. And there's a sense that Wolfgang Schäuble uh, was willing to reach out the hand temporarily, but has come back to this extremely strict and kind of this image that we had of Wolfgang Schäuble in the, in the financial crisis in 2008, 2009 of the, the strict German finance minister. And there's a sense that Schäuble is holding on to the remnants of something that perhaps doesn't exist, that Olaf Scholz better embodies where Germany is right now on European integration on, mm -hmm. and on fiscal policy, which is a loosening of the purse strings of it and understanding that debt is cheap right now and debt might be cheap for some time and that there's been a complete lack of public investment by the German government and perhaps also by the European Union and that this is the time to address that. And so it came up, um, yeah, it, it came across, let's say, a bit as... Um, out of tune with with where Germany is at the moment, and also kind of an angry, um, if I may, ramblings of a of a finance minister who perhaps is is in his or former finance minister, of course now president of the Bundestag, who's mm -hmm. uh, kind of trying to hold on to this uh, this former orthodoxy that no longer rules economic think. But I think it, it comes back to something else that you've sort of touched on during the course of our conversation today. Um, a, a bigger question of what do the parties stand for? Sort of what are the party profiles, especially as a, you know, we, we look at what might happen over the next few months in the run up to the election as each party tries to distance itself from the others and define itself. Mm -hmm. That's something that the parties, you know, certainly struggled with uh, four years ago in the election. Uh, and when they came out of the election, the, the sort of response was, we didn't do as well as we could have because voters didn't know what we stood for. Um, yeah. That seems to be very much the case this time around again, unless something changes over the next few weeks. Yeah, certainly. I, I think that's definitely the case. And that's something that all of the parties are very keen to address. And you've seen in their um, various kind of the, the, the first uh, bits and, and, and pieces that we've gotten from campaigning, um, that that is something that they are aware of. It's becoming increasingly difficult, especially in a pandemic where you you know there's not a lot of um, campaigning uh, and and you know kind of really visible presence of candidates and parties on the streets as you would ha uh, have in the past. But I'd say also in particular because if we come back to the very first point that we had of this election in, in um, Saxony-Anhalt of the mainstream democratic parties banding together to fight against the AfD, that again you know those are the types of uh, uh, of steps that are taken that of course, are very effective in defending democratic institutions and democratic practices, but also doesn't help the parties define themselves uh, as, as separate, representing separate and, and different interests. Um, and so that's something that it's going to be very interesting to see how they tease that out over the course of the coming weeks. One, I think, is, is you know, one thing that's, I think, very interesting is that you see a party like the Free Democrats, the FDP, taking a very clear stance as the anti-raising taxes party, right? So that's something that they really hung their hat upon to say, this is this is going to be our um, slogan going into this campaign. And it really does set us apart from others. And the Greens have, have made very clear that this, you know, essentially massive investment over the next 10 years in, in green energy and decarbonizing the economy. That's going to be our central slogan. And we're still waiting for the Christian Democrats. We're still waiting for mm -hmm. the, the biggest party. I'm not sure mm -hmm. they don't have a party program introduced. They have not uh, actually ever introduced what their, what their central thrust going to this campaign is going to be. Um, and so that's something that's sorely lacking and makes it even more difficult for them to define themselves, of course. Mm -hmm. So as we, as we start to come to the close um, of our conversation today, let me maybe switch gears um, a little bit. Uh, yeah. In our Café Pausa events, we always try to sort of look at what's in the news, what's making headlines, um, what are people thinking about? And of course, um, this is a, a big week because um, uh, the G7 summit is taking place, the NATO summit will be taking place, the US-EU summit will be taking place, and of course, Biden will be meeting with Vladimir Putin in, in Geneva. So what are people saying about Biden's visit? What's the state of the transatlantic relationship right now? How are, how are people looking at that? I think there's a lot of hope in this restart of multilateral institutions and that this flurry of um, international affairs of, of events coming up in these next two weeks 
uh, is perhaps the best platform to showcase this. The fact that we're going to see this NATO summit, as you said, an EU summit and, and, and President Biden taking um, an active role in all of this is a real chance to push forward some of these important multilateral um, agenda points that, that have not yet been uh, addressed. But I think there's real skepticism of what President Biden can achieve with President Putin. Now, there's a real sense that there's been such a backsliding on behalf of Russia when it comes to its support for Belarus, for example, or now it's threatening essentially to weaponize the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, as was feared all along, um, that there is not a, a lot of hope that very much concrete can come out of that summit. We know that both President Putin and President Biden have, have been more than at odds, of course, they're, they're um, with each other. And I think, uh, there is perhaps an understanding that this is a gesture from President Biden um, to, to, to meet you know, Vladimir Putin face to face and try to address some of the, the, the great cybersecurity um, you know, uh, concerns that the US has and of course that Europe has at the moment as well, but that there is not much that President Biden will be able to secure out of that. Uh, when it comes to NATO and the EU, um, there is, I think, a also a lot of hope that the U.S. will support European efforts to um, kind of forge more European security sovereignty as well, uh, that the U.S. will not only, um, you know, put their, put their, throw their weight behind it, but also actively support the, the, uh, the European efforts to become more uh, independent when it comes to security and, and uh, when it comes to defense as well. And when it comes to the NATO summit, there are some very real immediate concerns how to deal with what we saw with Belarus, how to deal with um, what, what is perceived as Russia's support and aggression. Um, and so there are some real pressing topics and an eagerness, you really sense it, an eagerness to get to work with the US on these topics um, face to face and to hammer out some of um, the policies that perhaps can be put in place. I do think there's a concern that there might be some diverging interests uh, on China, for example, um, when it comes to the US, and that there might also be some diverging interests when it comes to um, reigning in big tech companies that are American companies, of course, mm -hmm. and um, how close and how eye to eye the two sides are um, when it comes to those topics. But all in all, I think this is really seen as a big chance for multilateralism, which is something that is seen as an alliance of democracies. And that's something that was sorely missed, as we know. Well, Sumi, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as, as we've found in the last 40 minutes or so, there is a lot to talk about, and I hope we'll have an opportunity to continue the conversation again in the future. But I think we, we covered a lot of different topics. You've given us some great insights on the Stimmung, on the atmosphere uh, in, in Germany right now, and we are greatly appreciative of that. So we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you so much, Steve. It was a pleasure to be part of it. And to everybody who joined us today, um, as you know, we do our Kaffee Pausen every week. Uh, we hope that you will join us again for other Kaffee Pausa events. If you are interested in a deeper dive into the election results in Saxony-Anhalt, you can join us at 11 o'clock today or 17 Uhr if you're tuning in from Germany, where we will be discussing uh, the election in even more detail than we just talked uh, with Sumi about. So Sumi, thanks again. Um, greetings to Berlin, and we look forward to uh, connecting in person when it is possible to do that. Likewise, thank you so much, and I wish everyone a good day. Take care. Take care, goodbye.